Once a year, in honour of the Nadam holiday in July, girls and boys between 6 and 12 years old demonstrate how fast they can cover 30 kilometres on horseback. That day, thousands of Mongols from all over the world returned to their homeland in order to celebrate the independence they gained from China in 1921. These children have grown up in saddles. Without a horse, a Mongol is only half human. Just like a thousand years ago, the two are deeply connected. But this small girl isn't quite yet sure what to make of that. Nowhere else in the world is a country so sparsely populated and nowhere else are there more animals per person. Mongolia lies in the heart of Central Asia between two giants, China and Russia. 2.5 million people live in this country. The herds are the centre of their lives. Even today, approximately a third of Mongols still live as nomads in their traditional yurts or gurs, as the inhabitants call their dwellings. As romantic as a nomadic life may seem to outsiders, everyday life is hard. 29-year-old Zetsky, nomads only use one name, has known this life since he was a small child. She now wants to give it up for the sake of her own two children. We lost a lot of animals over the last four, five years. This winter is again supposed to be as harsh. The children soon start school, then we want to move into town. I'm not yet sure how we will survive there. It scares me. The woman is right. I've been an animal herder since I was 16. I don't know anything else, but maybe we can sell vegetables or something like that in the city. The magic word is Ulaanbaatar, the capital of Mongolia. This is where people move to when they can no longer live from livestock alone. Mongolia has lived through a turbulent history. The Manchu emperors subdued inner and outer Mongolia. Inner Mongolia still belongs to China today. Outer Mongolia gained independence in 1911, but in reality, the Chinese were still in control. In 1921, Mongolia became communist. Shortly thereafter began waves of political cleansing against other parties. 100,000 people died under Korlan Shoibasan, the new Mongolian dictator, a ruler who was supported by Stalin. In 1939, Zhimshagin Sesbandal took office as a secretary general in the Communist Party. But in fact, his Russian wife was a secret regent. Later on, Sesbandal became prime minister, but the Russians were still pulling the strings. The Soviet involvement in Mongolia lasted for 70 years. The turning point came in 1990. Sit down and hunger strikes took place in the capital's central square, eventually forcing the government to step down. In 1992, the country's first free and confidential elections took place. 
Since then, the former People's Republic of Mongolia has simply been known as Mongolia. The Mongols recently elected a new parliament. For the first time since 1990 and in the country's history, a coalition government is in power. In the past, communists and democrats had taken turns for years. We must work, we must work. We have to work on further moving Mongolia forward so that the mistakes of the past few years will not come back, so that Mongolia commits itself again to the democratic values and that human rights are not harmed here, so that the press, the radio and the television are not controlled, that the opposition also has a right to voice its opinion and that everybody doesn't have to worry about his or her political affiliation. Dass die Opposition äh, hier auch äh, Rederecht hat und dass äh, jeder nicht um seine politische äh, äh, Zugehörigkeit äh, bangen muss. After 1990, freedom of the press had first to be learned. The country had been cut off from the outside world up until a little more than a decade ago. With a democratic constitution based on the German model, Mongolia has turned its back on socialism for good. For nomads, radio is the only information source. Non-governmental organizations, such as the United Nations Development Programme, assist media projects financially and with advice for journalists. Even after the 1990 turning point, it could be dangerous for journalists to report about the government's corruption. Those with differing opinions were fired and replaced with members of the party. The leaders of the MRVP, the Communist Party, controlled and kept the mass media under surveillance. Three journalists were sent to jail for their criticism of leading officials. Under the communists, journalists were indoctrinated. Since the 1990 turning point, a lot, even too many, newspapers have emerged. Some are interested in making money. The readers will be the ones choosing. They won't buy newspapers that they don't like. The transfer to a market economy has been accomplished the quickest in the capital, Ulaanbaatar. Modern display panels let the new generation know about what they don't possess yet. The old Mongolia is actually quite young. Three quarters of today's population is under 35 years old. The first free businesses cropped up in the central square facing the government buildings. Here, photographers sell their services, while race cars for children and all kinds of kitsch are offers for sale. In the countryside, the breakdown of a planned economy looks more like this. This ruin stands where coal once used to be extracted. 95% of Mongolia's external trade used to be conducted over the Eastern Bloc countries. Today, the poorest of the poor are mining the coal illegally so that they can...